Hi, imagine you do a very good nerve repair in a brachial plexus injury and it grows beautifully to reach the muscle just to find that all the motor units are degenerated. Imagine you see a patient with a brachial plexus injury and you plan his surgery and he comes back to you for the surgery with a stiff elbow, stiff shoulder and severe pain. Imagine you have done a muscle transfer and by the time the POP is off and you start mobilization, all the joints are stiff and not moving at all. What is missing in all the above scenarios is the timely and necessary intervention by the therapist. Management of a brachial plexus injury is incomplete without the help of a trained and dedicated therapist. So, which brachial plexus injury patient needs a therapist? Every single patient. In the next few minutes, we shall be seeing the role played by the therapist in the reconstruction of brachial plexus injuries. What is electrical stimulation and how is it given? How is the range of motion exercises given? Generally, the role of the therapist in any brachial plexus injury can be summed up in what I refer to as the S3-M2R concept. Of the S3, S1 refers to the skin. Any scars, induration, edema is taken care of by the therapist. S2 refers to the skeleton. Any bony injuries, for instance, brachial plexus injuries can be associated with fractures of the scapular region, of the forearm bones, etc. These should be taken care of by the therapist and when they give plan the therapy, they make sure that pain is not induced and fracture healing of these areas is not affected. S3 refers to the sensation. The therapist makes an assessment of the sensation and gives advice to the patient about taking care of the anesthetic hand. Coming to the M2 of the S3 M2R, M1 stands for the passive range of movement that is the PROM. The therapist ensures that the full passive range of movements of all the joints of the upper limb. M2 refers to the active range of movements that is the AROM. That is, the therapist is able to assess which muscles are moving and keeps them active and ensures that their full capacity is achieved. And of course, R stands for rehabilitation in the S3 M2R protocol. Rehabilitation that is given both preoperatively and postoperatively. Physiotherapy plays an integral part of the management of brachial plexus injuries. When do we send the patient for physiotherapy and when is it actually required? Whether the patient is being treated conservatively and no surgery is being planned, even then the patient requires physiotherapy. If surgery is being planned as part of the reconstruction, the patient must be seen by the therapist and given necessary physiotherapy. And after the surgery, the patient once again requires therapy to ensure a good follow through of the surgical procedures. After the surgeon does a thorough clinical examination of the patient with a brachial plexus injury, the patient is sent to the therapist. The physiotherapist first starts by doing a good assessment. This will help the therapist to know the baseline and the condition of the patient at which the therapy is started. We have a simple format which is filled by the therapist before the therapy is started. This format uses color coding which gives a visual impact. The active and passive range of movements are instituted. The sensation is assessed and the pain assessment is also done either by the visual analog score or any other scoring pattern. The edema or induration of the scars on the hand are assessed and the function and the activities of daily living are also assessed. In short, the role of the therapist in the pre-operative session consists of five important features. The first is range of motion exercises. The second is sling and plint application. The third is edema control. Fourth is scar management and fifth is muscle stimulation. The range of motion exercises as I have already mentioned would include both the active range of movement and the passive range of movement. It is important that the passive range of movements are done about 4 to 6 times a day with 10 to 20 repetitions. We shall now see the total set of passive range of exercises which are given even to the patient with the totally flail upper limb. Complete flexion of the shoulder joint with the upper limb moved up to above the head of the patient. This can be done either by the therapist in the center or by the patient caregiver or by the patient himself by using the opposite uninjured upper limb by stabilizing the shoulder 
shoulder, shoulder abduction exercises are then done. By keeping the shoulder at abducted position of 45 degrees and stabilizing the elbow on the couch, internal and external rotation exercises of the shoulder are done. With the same elbow support on the couch, elbow flexion and extension exercises are done. Now full range of pronation and supination are done on the forearm. Then wrist extension, wrist flexion and wrist as the circumduction exercises are instituted. Thumb abduction exercises are very important concentrating on radial abduction and maintenance of the thumb web. Interphalangeal joint flexion of the thumb is also instituted. Flexion of the fingers by concentrating first on metacarpophalangeal joint flexion followed by interphalangeal joint flexion is then done for all the fingers sequentially. The next part of the preoperative therapy consists of the slings and necessary splints. Slings are necessary to prevent inferior glenohumeral subluxation and they help to hold the humerus in normal or slightly elevated position within the socket. Such elbow slings are good but they should also be monitored properly as the position of the fingers and appropriate splints must be applied to keep the hand and fingers in desirable position. In this patient, the metacarpophalangeal joints of the fingers have been kept in extension which is again not desirable. The third feature of the preoperative therapy is the edema control which can be achieved with decongestive massage, compression sleeve and elevation alone. Scar management is also dealt with by the therapist in the form of ultrasound scar massage which can also be augmented with gel sheeting. The last feature of the preoperative therapy is the muscle stimulation. We need to understand this muscle stimulation. There are two types of currents that can be given. One is the galvanic current and the Faraday current. The galvanic current is usually given. It is a direct current but it is painful and to avoid the pain, interrupted galvanic current IGC is usually given. It is usually given for denervated muscle stimulation because this galvanic current can act on a muscle that has been denervated. Stimulation causes contraction of this denervated muscle which has five important uses. It helps limit the edema. It limits the venous stasis in the muscle. It delays the muscle fiber degeneration. It delays fibrosis of the muscle and also recovery time is shortened. On the other hand, Faraday current will not stimulate denervated muscle because it acts by depolarizing the nerve. Hence, the nerve must be intact for the Faraday current to act. Hence, it can be used when the innervated muscle is weak and has to be strengthened. The electrical muscle stimulation is given at different points for different muscles. These diagrams show the muscle stimulation points for the anterior and middle fibers of the deltoid, the coracobrachialis and the biceps brachii, the pronator teres brachioradialis and the middle and distal part of the forearm, the flexor carpi radialis, flexor pollicis longus, flexor digitorum profundus and the flexor carpi ulnaris, the flexor digitorum superficialis and the hypothenar muscles, the thenar muscles consisting of the abductor pollicis brevis, the opponent's pollicis and the flexor pollicis brevis and the lumbrical muscles. On the posterior aspect of the upper limb, the muscle stimulation points are as follows. The posterior fibers of the deltoid, the stimulation points for the triceps which consists of the long head, lateral head and the medial head and the stimulation points for the extensor carpi ulnaris, extensor digitorum communis and the dorsal intrasciae. The points for the abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis and the extensor pollicis longus are more on the radial side of the distal forearm on the extensor aspect. We shall now see how electrical stimulation is given. Here it is being given for the deltoid. What you can see are two electrodes. This is the neutral electrode or the indifferent electrode and this is the stimulating electrode which is kept in this patient on the deltoid region. This patient has a C6 lesion, his deltoid has recovered, his biceps has not. On applying intermittent galvanic current that is IGC to the deltoid region, the strength of the stimulus is slowly increased till the contraction is achieved. Here you can make out the contraction, the stimulation of the muscle. The strength at which this contraction is achieved is also important as we shall see later. 
Now IGC is being given to the biceps muscle which is denervated. You can note the contraction but you can also note the current at which this contraction is achieved which is more than what was needed for the contraction to be achieved in the re-innervated deltoid muscle. That was as far as the pre-operative therapy was concerned. After the surgery, the post-operative therapy begins. It consists of scar management again, the passive range and active range of motion exercises, avoiding trick movements, activation techniques, gravity eliminated strengthening, anti-gravity strengthening and substitute muscle patterning. The scar management and the PROM and the AROM are as has already been described in the pre-operative therapy. What we need to concentrate on now are the activation techniques by using muscle stimulation and the other strengthening exercises. The electrical stimulation is started about 3 weeks after surgery. This is first given for the other parts that are not been involved and it starts at 6 weeks for the involved muscles and it started with galvanic current or IGC as we have already said. It starts with a slightly longer duration of the current so that the muscle starts contracting. As the muscle keeps re this duration keeps getting lesser and lesser. And when the time of stimulation decreases to 20 milliseconds or less, voluntary contractions begin. The electrodes are placed over the muscle of the recipient nerve. This produces a contraction of the muscle of the recipient nerve and keeps the neuromuscular junction units active. It also facilitates the growth of the affected recipient nerve. First, long duration galvanic current is given. When the power gradually improves, Short duration faradic current is given when the renervation starts occurring. For example, when the intercostal nerve transfer is done to the nerve to biceps, the initial muscle strength of the biceps is zero. Electrodes are placed over the biceps and intermittent galvanic current is given to produce contraction in the denervated biceps muscle as we have already seen. When this contraction of the recipient muscle occurs, the patient is asked to do the action of the donor nerve that is the intercostal nerve which is deep breathing or chest expansion exercise. These are called the induction exercises. Slowly, the dissociation of movements using biofeedback is started and controlled recipient contraction is the focus. That is, the patient should be able to contract the biceps without doing the induction of deep breathing or chest expansion. Slowly, the power of the muscle improves and gravity eliminated exercises are given to achieve a muscle power of grade 2. After grade 2 muscle strength is achieved, further strengthening is done using weights. After nerve transfers, we need to consider two things. What does the donor nerve do and what does the recipient nerve do? We shall consider all these two important steps for three important nerve transfers. The spinal accessory nerve transfer to the suprascapular nerve, the ulnar nerve fascicle to the biceps nerve and the intercostal nerves to the elbow flexors. The spinal accessory nerve innervates the trapezius mainly and it causes turning of the head to the opposite side with the extension and shrugging. The suprascapular nerve is going to achieve abduction and external rotation. So, to stimulate the spinal accessory nerve, the patient is asked to shrug the shoulders and turn the head away from the involved arm while looking up. Likewise, the ulnar nerve mainly is concentrated on key pinch and ulnar deviation of the wrist, whereas the musculocutaneous nerve to which this ulnar nerve fascicle has been given concentrates on elbow flexion. So, to achieve elbow flexion, the patient is asked to perform the key pinch and ulnar wrist deviation and simultaneously flex the elbow. And we have already seen the example of the intercostal nerve which is for deep breathing and the musculocutaneous nerve which is for elbow flexion. When the intercostal nerve has been transferred to the musculocutaneous nerve, we need to ask the patient to perform deep breathing to flex the elbow. As was mentioned earlier, all these movements are coordinated with some other movement that is the movement of the donor nerve. To enhance the separation of these two, there are three important steps in graded motor imagery. The first is implicit motor imagery where it involves right-left discrimination. 
explicit motor imagery involves imagination of movements without actually performing them and mirror therapy where the patients are asked to see the movement of the unaffected extremity on the mirror which is kept in front of them one of the most important surgeries in brachial plexus reconstruction is the use of the free functional muscle transfer click here to see the video on free functioning muscle transfer and do not forget to subscribe to this channel to keep updated on simplifying hand surgery procedures.